coffee was uh, stronger than mine because um, it's been a long uh, morning and uh, keeping you awake uh, and also interested in what's going to happen next when uh, you're going to get some philosophy, that's a hard task. Especially because some of you might have been exposed to the wrong kind. Uh, the sort of uh, first wine you tasted when you were you know, young and that was disgusting and you never came close to it anymore and you've been drinking beer ever since. Uh, no, there is good philosophy, there is good wine. So uh, I hope I can serve some of the good stuff uh, today. Now, uh, you think that I might have been free in choosing the topic, I was not. Uh, and if you know her, but you know exactly that he's gonna tell you what to do, how to do it, when. And I welcome very much the challenge. He says, well, why don't you tell us something about artificial intelligence, the impact on our lives, how you see it today, tomorrow? I say, yeah, that's a, that's a great topic. Especially because there's a lot of science fiction and I'm being generous with the word. So I like science fiction. Let's say it's science fiction, uh, the other words that begin with the S that would be improper to use here, science fiction uh, uh, about uh, the impact of uh, AI and some reality. Now, it's a long, long story. And I put that there so that we remember that at least in this corner of the world, we've been talking about robots for millennia. That is the Iliad, uh, you know, quite a classic, uh, and that is the description of these beautiful robots, the, that volcano uh, the god has been able to build uh, as sort of uh, automatic slaves, helping him uh, to get things done. Uh, they are good slaves, slaves that um, do things for him as he likes. A marvels indeed to see. Now, that's the way they look to us today. And you haven't seen a movie, I won't tell you anything about it. But do, do go. It's, uh, it's quite remarkable. So these robots, this AI, these uh, sort of automatic uh, uh, autonomous agents uh, have become more of a reality. It's not uh, mythology, it's not some kind of a, a Greek poet talking about Greek gods. It's more like uh, your uh, industrial uh, company, your lab around the corner. What's the reality here? Should we be worried about this AI? They're marvelous, like the gods, but are they going to take over? Is that something that we should really be more than just concerned? And that's the part of the talk on the sci-fi side. It's also known as singularity, for those of you who unfortunately follow these kind of things. Uh, you shouldn't waste your time, as I do. Uh, <laughs> The singularity uh, is quite simple. I mean, these robots are evolving. They will be uh, getting faster, smarter by the day. One day, they're going to be so fast, so smart, that they will outsmart us, reach that point, the singularity point. They switch. They start regulating, dominating what we do. They become the masters, and they start reproducing. We are left behind. We are a disappearing species. The world will be dominated by uh, the new uh, super intelligence. Uh, call it, uh, just for the purpose of this talk, Aidzilla kind of idea. You know? This immense sort of uh, uh, piece of robotic that is going to be there. Now, you say, oh, surely not. Oh, yeah, no, no, let me convince you that that's the case. If these robots come, they it will be terrible. If we create them, we're screwed. Yes, <laughs> that's true. That's logic for you. In the same way that if some extraterrestrial life lands today here, we're screwed. That if the four horses of the apocalypse no, appear, we're screwed. It's just not going to happen. It's the if that is the wrong side, don't follow the then. So that's not going to go anywhere in convincing us that this Aidzilla is happening. Oh, but surely you could. Uh -huh, don't, don't, don't be so simple. Uh, there is a possibility there. Yes, there is. In the same sense in which unicorns could exist. Yes, they could. <laughs> and I know, we know we, no, there are strange labs out there, no, any biotech. How long does it take to bioengineer a unicorn? Nothing. I mean, we've done funnier things. It's just a horse with a little horn. Right? <laughs> but they don't exist. And therefore, you, know, you have a sense of what could means. Could here means there is no contradiction in assuming that such and such is possible. There isn't. Contradictions don't exist. Married bachelors, they're not there. But 
possibly people who get 10 million pounds from a Nigerian guy so kind. That's a possibility, but I wouldn't really bank on it, right? And that's expecting you know, the AI to develop. Is it a Nigerian scam? Uh, yeah, well, you, you've been too easy on this, uh, Professor Freud. Surely you are underestimating the exponential growth. Exponential. Yeah, there are things that go exponential. My Roomba, I'll come back to that in a moment. If you haven't met Roomba, I will introduce her properly in a little while. My Roomba cleans the floor very nicely. The next model will do that for less energy, faster. Assume that that goes exponential. Less and less energy, faster and faster. The way she cleans the floor is amazing. And then you wonder, I really need a coffee. And Roomba, she doesn't do the coffee. She has this exponential growth within a limited context. The context being cleaning the floor. Faster and faster, better and better. So even something exponential, and there isn't uh, no, too much faith in this exponential, more on this in a moment, growth doesn't ensure anything. It just tells you that yes, something goes better and better for less and less money. But does it get any closer to, for example, understanding what you really mean when you go, yeah, yeah, uh, not really. Still, there is a final line. Uh, you surely be aware that you better be safe than sorry. Oh, yes, yes, you always want to be safe than sorry. Uh, it's just that there has to be something to be sorry about. Because if there's nothing to be sorry about, well, then what's the point about being safe? Uh, Luciano, don't take that flight. I mean, you better be safe than sorry. No, no, it's a, it's a safe flight. And I won't be able to go to New York unless I get that flight. So, oh, you're being really unreasonable. No, not. You're unreasonable. So these are the arguments that if you scratch the surface, that's what you find behind the singularity. And uh, of course, at that point, you have a disagreement. So is it or is it not going to happen? Is AI the real thing, the sort of mythological, Homeric kind of stuff going to happen sooner or later? Well, we have a test. And you must have encountered this a thousand times. So I'm going to do it really quickly for those of you who you know, have even thought about this. And it's, of course, the Turing test. There it is. You are C, the little guy down there, and you want to check whether singularity has finally happened, AI is real. You ask two agents on the other side of the wall. One is human, and the other one is, is a robot. You don't know who is who. You ask questions for about five minutes, and if you cannot distinguish who is the human and which one is the machine, well, the machine will have passed the test, or at least the human is pretty stupid. One of the two. Uh, normally, uh, I've done this with the BBC, first time that uh, the Leibniz Prize came to the UK. The real stupid is the one who's asking the question. They were asking, I was going like, don't do that, don't do that. Do you believe in God? Said, yes, no. Oh, I can't see the difference. Yeah. I know, that's not the, that's not the question. <laughs> so I said, second question, BBC journalist, do you like ice cream? Yes, no. Oh my goodness, he's passing the test. No, no, you, you are not passing the test. <laughs> You need to ask questions that somehow challenge the other things. So suppose that you ask challenging questions. How long is it going to take for machines to pass the Turing test? Well, Turing had a pretty straightforward idea. He said, 50 years. And why 50 years? Well, because he published the paper in 1950. And he had five fingers. So 50 years. Take or leave it. So he said, by 2000, the Turing test will be passed. Wrong. You haven't seen it around. It didn't happen. So he was wrong, but no, people don't get people in Cambridge wrong for nothing. Like, so he says, uh, no, 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 it's, it's going to be 2018. Uh, why 2018? That's going to be very precise. Well, 2018, because um, uh, he was giving a talk, Eric Schmidt, um, in 2013, and he said, in five years. There you go. Five fingers. Uh, so 2018 is a good date, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, more interesting is 2028. There must be something about eight. Well, no, that's uh, Kurzweil. I said, well, the singularity will happen in 2028. And that's because I discovered by then he will be 80. OK, well, so that's a round way of doing science. By the time I'm 80, this will have happened. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I'm not quite sure that that's exactly the way we do things in the computer lab. The best one, however, still comes from Cambridge. There is the smart move. And you know why. Nobody will be there to check. <laughs> like, 
Uh, maybe the robots, not me, not him, for sure. <laughs> so, so Stephen Hawking says, oh, no, no, speaking in, you know when, said, in 100 years, smarter than Alan Turing, who said 50 and got caught. So clearly this thing is not happening, it's not going anywhere. Why? Well, the Leibniz Prize, which is the closest we have to passing the Turing test, uh, this is uh, the result from last year. The question was, the car would not fit in the parking space because it was too small. Simple. What was too small? And because the poor thing does not understand the process, symbols that without any meaning, without any relevance, without any truth, replied, I'm not a walking encyclopedia, you know. Oh, I know that you are a computer, my dear. <laughs> so here is my challenge. I like to call it the aubergine challenge. I hate aubergine. <laughs> but to Eric Schmidt and anyone who wants to pick up the challenge, if that test will be passed by 2018, I'm going to eat a plate full of it. <laughs> back here, if her uh, wants me back. So this is um, the, the science fiction. This is not what's going to happen at all. Let's relax, let's go back to real business, because there are plenty of problems. This is the reality. That's Roomba. And uh, we know what, what's going on here. This is uh, uh, too trivial to be explained to this audience. These are you know, sort of iconic um, uh, graphs of our age, how fast uh, our processors are developing, how cheaper by the day they are becoming, the amount amazing amount of data that all this is generating by the day. We were all born around here, 2020, 35 zettabyte of stuff. And even if they're wrong by 50%, that's still staggering anyway. And they're probably not. Now, they're now talking about 40. So that means that basically all the data we have in the world have been generated uh, within one generation. We made the whole thing. Now, in this context, of course, who is talking to whom? Machines. So we also know that. We also know that most of our communication happens machine to machine. Human dialogue, almost negligible if you are a sociologist from Mars and wants to know about how much is happening in terms of exchanging of data. We passed the point where there were more connected devices than people a long time ago. And by the time it's 2020, more or less, there will be six, seven connected devices per person. Those are the numbers, more or less. And mind that these are numbers that refer to the whole world population. Anyone here? Well, we probably have three or four times these gadgets around us. They are doing all the chit chatting. All those green and white and red lights that you see when you go home, uh, mysteriously communicating, making the protocols work, and so on. Why is all that important? Because Something has happened that I would like you to be fully convinced about. We were trying, we've been trying to adapt stupid artificial systems to the world and failed miserably. What we have done for the past 50 years is to adapt the world to them. We have enveloping, using a word from engineering, the world around them so that they can go around in a street. They know their position because of a GPS. There are enough sensors, enough data, enough protocols of all kinds, enough humans tagging pictures and so on and on to make sure that the environment has become IT friendly. No wonder they work well. So grandma used to work inside a computer. Her daughter walked out. Her granddaughter walked in again. We all work within this huge sort of um, dishwasher that has been constructed around us. You can call it the infosphere if you like, a fancy word. What does it look like? Well, that's the infosphere. You build a whole envelope, ontology for the computer scientists, around the very simple abilities of a machine. Nobody in his right mind you know, clean the dishes that way, you know, outside the dishwasher. I'm doing the dishes, darling. No. You build a whole envelope around that. This is a successful robot. This is a silly dream. And that, <laughs> that is exactly what I want. Because I'm, the moment, I am the interface between this and this. And I want that interface to disappear. How many people would you like to buy this? Like, you no, know, you just put everything there and automatically puts everything in the dishes. Brilliant. Now, uh, one relaxing point. 
these guys, they're not going to take the world. No, there's no aidzilla there. There's just a more comfortable humanity doing something else. So, so far, so good. Is it just a very rosy picture? Or does it mean they all relax, or have a Coke, a uh, gin and tonic, there would be robots doing the job for you? Uh, no, not at all. So here's when I get a little bit more annoyed with the singularity business, because it's such a, an immense magnet for mass media that distracts society from the real problems. Uh, the phrase uh, mass distraction has a, a bad feeling, at least in our country, but that's what it is, is mass distraction from the real issues, some of which I'm going to introduce in the next few minutes. There are four challenges, and four, just because I thought we didn't have time for more. <laughs> replaceable agency, that's true, that's us. We are replaceable. If I'm the interface between the dirty dishes and the dishwasher, well, the moment you have that robot, my job is gone. And this is what happens to the American market if you have that sort of uh, input. This is what happens to the jobs uh, market once you have automatic computerized systems taking place. Some jobs will be unassailable, some others will be utterly delegated, but what is in the middle, a lot of that will disappear. In other words, white collar jobs, uh, for example. Not because they, they won't be there, but because one person will do the job of 10, 15, 20, and what happens to the 19, the 29. This is what happens, however, if you, sorry, this is America, what happens if you, uh, like in Finland, run the same numbers, but you start introducing legislation. Something that says, oh yes, there won't be any job for a car driver in this country unless we, by law, decide that cars need to be driven by humans only. And bingo, you're back to no, point one. So the situation is complex, but that, in terms of agency and being smart, we are replaceable. We are predictable, and predictable by the machines we're building. Every time you go back, you have that toothpaste, and, and the computer says, I knew you would buy that toothpaste. Yeah, know, so that's, that's me being rational. But that's not just the only point. Uh, that's already 2013, Philadelphia courts begins using computer forecasts to predict future criminal behavior and modify what uh, is going to do in terms of punishing that individual to reinforce less or more the punishment so that that will teach a lesson. And that is based on big data and anticipatory uh, computing. We're also very influential in the same way in which you know, Amazon tells you, no, if you like this, maybe you like that too. Uh, that's true. How influential? Well, interestingly, you know, when it comes to computers taking over, this is uh, the uh, sort of forecast of the billion of dollars that will be depending on so-called programmatic advertising. Programmatic advertising being something that maybe you don't hear about every day, but uh, exactly as in financial context is all about you know, programs fighting each other. Well, likewise, if you had to bid for and buy and make sure that your advertisement in Google is there rather than your opponent, well, that is what programmatic advertising does for you. A big fight, no humans involved, not very much, too fast, too quick, too smart for us to be uh, more than just on, not in, on the loop. And that is the future. No, this sort of little gadgets influencing more and more people about really, really what you always wanted since yesterday. We're also dependent. We're also building around these smart technologies, remember we are shaping the infosphere around their abilities, a very fragile, uh, sophisticated world. And this delegation comes with a high cost. A bit more data here, by 2050, roughly 70% of the human population will be living in big cities. And those may or may not be that smart, but certainly they heavily dependent on anything from a piece of code to a little robot doing this and that properly. So we are sitting on top of an immense amount of uh, IT that better work properly. And that's what uh, our life uh, are going to depend on. So what's uh, left in the few more minutes that I have is i like to uh, leave space for some Q&A. The question that we need to ask is not, is there going to be an A, Zilla, uh, no, the singular, that, that's, that's hugely distracting. Let's, let's be serious about this. The question I want to ask is, okay, what kind of infosphere we want to build? Us, is our responsibility. 
And what sort of human project do we want to pursue apart from making sure that our GDP is better than dot, dot points? Because that, the GDP, the jobs, the unemployment, the inflation, all that is the oil in the car. It doesn't tell you where you want to go. The point is, what's the plan? What's the journey? Yes, we need no, the conditions to go there. But what kind of society do we want to build on top of all this technology? That is the challenge for our generation. The one which, by the way, is unique, not because we're so special, but just we you know, got the chance of being at the transition time when we move from the non-digital to the digital. Two generations down, down the road will have no idea what the world looked like. But some people around here, they remember where there were no mobiles, looking here included, uh, or there were no white and black TVs and so on. Well, that generation has the responsibility of providing the foundations for a decent society for the future, and above all, not getting distracted with some kind of a nightmare science fiction. So what we need to do is think deeper, and that's a bit of a pitch for philosophy, please. Uh, be more philosophical in what you're doing, in the good sense, in the good wine sense that I introduced before. Design better, design for the future, design robustly. That is essential because we are here for the long run, not for the gadget, not for the next app. And be mindful because all this is going to be the next environment for millions, if not billions of people. Remember, 70% of humanity living in big cities, those cities will be part of the infosphere. It will be up to us to make sure that there are no nightmares. And since we started with classic, we end with classic. Here we are, Shakespeare. Men are sometime are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. If we don't want to be, it's entirely 100% us, our responsibility for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of minutes for questions, if that's OK. Please. Um, and, uh, and thank you for that terrific opening to, to Thinking Digital. Um, so is all this, if you will, fear of AI and the singularity effectively kind of like how we fear sharks uh, unnaturally, uh, in a naturally high way, given the number of deaths that actually occur from, from sharks? Uh, or how we fear air flight versus driving in our cars. Is it, is it driven by some, I mean, what's driving it ultimately? Because there is obviously, by uh, some smart people, I mean, you obviously you mentioned a few of them, uh, Elon Musk and, and others as well, who have, you know, for whatever reason, decided to go very public about, you know, uh, uh, instilling a, some fear, some degree of fear in, in the general population. Yes, the fear is, uh, uh, it's not unjustified entirely. It's, no, first of all, humanity always, is always worried and, and fears what is unknown. But there's unknown which doesn't exist, ghost. You, know, you might be really worried about, oh, is there a ghost in this house? And the point is that, no, there isn't, but you can't prove non-existence. That's an old story. No. Or you can be worried about, oh, is this a beach safe because there might be shark? Well, sharks are real. It's just that you, know, you are in the Mediterranean, and there are no sharks there, sorry. So let me be careful about this. The singularity is being worried about ghosts, not about sharks. Okay. So it's, it's really t thinking in terms of this thing is going to take off in and of itself and it's going to dominate us. The joke was that you know, even you know, Bill Gates came out and says, oh, yes, this is one of the main problems. And my joke in one of the issues was like, well, thank goodness we have windows because uh, you know, <laughs> it would never take over. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, I can see now the, the line of defense. <laughs> that was very smart. You build windows so the AI would never develop in the first place. <laughs> uh, so. yep. um, right, sorry. Uh, on, uh, it's all on record, right? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I, well, last year, um, we, we, we entertained a talk uh, from Blaise Aguirre Yarkis, which, which, talk, which we talked to him from Google, uh, who's, uh, who's working in their machine intelligence uh, group. And uh, one of the arguments he made, which you appear to agree with, is that um, he talked about this kind of, uh, if you will, arms race between uh, effectively capital versus labor 
uh, you know, which has been going on for hundreds, thousands of years, if you will, right? And that we're, we're at an end game, that uh, computing is actually getting so dramatically more powerful, more quickly, et cetera, et cetera, that vast swathes of jobs will go and they will not replace, there will not be other things that we can move to. So um, you, if you're a doctor, uh, you'll find that actually becoming a lawyer is an answer because that may be gone as well. Um, thoughts there, and, 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 and his suggestion was that we're heading towards a time where we need to seriously consider a kind of guaranteed minimum income for all and to detach this tra traditional link between self-worth and, and labor. Um, any thoughts there? Are we, are we, are we likely to see the, the death of, of, of traditional labor as, as we know it, if you will? Well, I don't know whether he was uh, quoting Keynes, but if he wasn't, uh, uh, he, he did. Oh, I mean, okay. Keynes already said, well, the future of humanity we'll see with industrial sort of developments going on and on better and better. At some point, the real problem, quote unquote, will be free time. What do we do with all the amount of time that people have been able to free thanks to you no know, those technologies that even Homer was dreaming for. Yeah. And uh, you know what, we, we've been living for a few centuries where we have coupled our moral worth with our job and labor, and that's a mistake, total mistake, especially from philosophy, trust me. Uh, working is not a good idea. Uh, <laughs> but being engaged, doing something that is of some interest, well, yes, definitely, that's what you want to have. Yeah. But then that requires a rebalancing of the so-called inequality. It means that all that amazing amount of wealth that is being generated by this fantastic intelligence that is invested in industrial computing and so on will have to percolate a little bit so that those who don't have all their opportunities will still be able to have a decent life. But ultimately, there's, a, uh, there's something that even the economist starts, uh, tries to sell to us, which is more of the same. Every industrial revolution of some kind destroys jobs and generates others, and the two balance out. Not true for a simple reason, and I close with that. There is an unfortunate thing that nobody wants to hear, but people in this room are safe. The Gaussian. A Gaussian curve, that is what represents the distribution of human intelligence, for example, and human skills. And some people are at the very bottom, the very silly. Some other people, Feynman and the, the, the Nobel laureate, are at the very end. Most of us are right in the middle. But when the revolution happens, that requirement shifts towards the right. It means that more and better intelligence, more skills will be required because it's not the same to, say, work in a factory or have to build up like a website the one we just saw. Yeah. So that job will appear, but it will require more skills, more intelligence, more education, and very few people will be up there. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with the rest of humanity? Well, make sure that they have a good time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you.